what I want to leave you with you today is two things. First of all, an understanding of what beyond budgeting is. Um, if you're cold on this, you might be positively surprised. Um, and also, um, hinting to the title, an understanding that there can be no agile transformation without beyond budgeting. Read my lips, it's simply impossible. Now, the author Douglas Adams, he once wrote that I may not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I ended up where I needed to be. And those words resonate with me because it was in no way given that I should stand here today and talk about beyond budgeting because my career started in a very different place. I'm a finance guy by education. Uh, after graduating from business school, I joined one of uh, Scandinavia's largest companies, used to be called Statol, no Equinor. And my first management job in that company the year after was head of the corporate budget department. So I've been heading up more budget processes in my life than I want to be reminded about. Uh, I have done a lot of stupid things, but it also means I know what I'm talking about. And also, I want you to um, also have in mind that when I talk about budgets, it's more than project budgets, cost budgets. It's the kind of the full finance definitions that we are talking um, uh, also profit and loss budgets and uh, cash flow budgets and kind of the full, full definition. Every time I discuss this topic with finance people, executives, there's one word that keeps coming up over and over again, and that word is control. And what do you think the context is? Of course, it is the fear of losing control. And I often ask these guys, OK, um, can you please explain to me what you are so afraid of losing? So what, what, how do you define control? And after people have said cost control, actually many go quiet. They struggle with putting words on what they are so afraid of losing. So I checked up in Oxford Dictionary, how do they define control? And they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what does this mean in organizational terms, in business terms? Well, basically two things, controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two main assumptions behind traditional management. Number one, you can't trust people. Number two, the future is predictable and planable. And you know, as well as I do, that that is not true. Not at all. These are more illusions of control. Well, of course you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, they hopefully find a way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. Talking about people and trust, uh, I've always traveled a lot, and the first thing I always check when I uh, come into the hotel room at night is what kind of clothing hangers do they have? Is it the one at the top with a hook, or is it this stupid one down here? <laughs> right? So, how come some hotels offer us these stupid hangers? And you know why. It is about a few stolen hangers with a hook. And what was the response from the hotels? To punish everybody because somebody did something wrong. Actually, one of the problems with traditional management, which I will come back to. Wise people out there have definitely agreed with what I just have said, talking about people. Good old Peter Drucker, most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And I fully agree because sometimes the problem is that we manage too much. And when it comes to predicting the future, planning, corporate planning, another wise person, Russell Aikoff, he compared a lot of the corporate planning he was observing in organizations uh, with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I can relate to this as well, because I have done a lot of dancing in my life. I don't think it really had a great uh, positive impact uh, on the performance of the organization, uh, rather the opposite, but the dancing was great, I think. Anyway, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that 100 years ago invented a fantastic machine. It was state-of-the-art and key for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble, it didn't work that well, and today, this machine looked like this. 
This is not a true story, because in real life, hopefully, people would have done something 50 years ago. Either try to fix this machine, or even better, try to invent a new one, new, different, and better. Because innovation is something we all love, right? Innovation is great, wonderful. We all want to be leading edge, unique, right on the forefront, ahead of everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation, into products and services and so on. But there is also something called management innovation that we shall talk about today, exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that is not great, that is scary. Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? The consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. There. Everybody is into that kind of innovation in some form or shape. Management innovation is not yet the crowded place because it is scary. Right? And that is actually good news for brave companies who dare to explore and embrace also this kind of innovation because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage out of management innovation as you can get from technology innovation. And there are companies who, out there who openly state that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce, um, sell, provide, we find it in the way we lead and manage. And I've got a few examples for you a little bit later. So it's all about performance. That is why we should go beyond budgeting, because it is good for performance defined in the right way. So I will come back to that um, important word. But before that, it is still called beyond budgeting. It has something to do with budgets and about solving budget problems. So before we move on, I want to share with you my budget problem list, which is quite long. Um, very time-consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets. Assumptions, quickly outdated. Uh, I mean, good luck to everybody now preparing the budget for 2024. It must be look like looking into a black hole. Good luck. This is a serious problem. Budgeting can stimulate what I would call unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the frenzy December spending, these are not the behaviors we would like to see between colleagues. At the same time, I'm not blaming anyone for behaving like this, because they are just responding to the system that we have designed for them to operate in. So, as you know, if we want to change behaviors, it's not about fixing people, it's about fixing systems. Budgets can create these illusions of control. Uh, of course, it might feel very comfortable to have next year described with a million details and decimals, but again, the only thing we know is that we don't know. So if we don't have control, whatever that word means, maybe it's better to accept it, acknowledge it, and act accordingly, than to think that we have control, to fool ourselves and act accordingly. Budgets force us to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn of the year before what we shall do next year and what it shall cost. And in um, uh, larger organizations, too often too many of these decisions are taken too high up. It doesn't always improve the quality of decisions. Very often it's the other way around. Budgets can prevent us from doing stuff that we should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget. And maybe this also sometimes works the other way around. Maybe it can lead us to do things that we maybe shouldn't have done. But it is in the budget, and it is spend it or lose it. And linked to this, I fully accept that the cost budget can be a very effective ceiling on cost. It typically works, but that's just half the story, because that ceiling is just effective as a floor, in the sense that these budgets tend to be spent for the reasons we just discussed. And to define good performance as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow, mechanical, and uh, very often a completely irrelevant way of defining good performance. We need a richer, broader performance language. Now, are there any of these problems that you haven't experienced in the organizations that you have worked with? If so, you are in very good company, because I've been sharing this list of problems with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the close to 30 years I've been working with Beyond Budgeting. And most people out there agree. Executives, finance people, a lot of nodding heads and guilty smiles when this list is coming up. At the same time, most companies out there continue doing this stuff, even if that is changing these days. And that's quite interesting. I have a theory which I want to share with you. But before that, I'd like to add on one problem, uh, one more problem that very few have on their list. 
I've called it conflict in purposes. I'll come back to that one. It's an interesting problem uh, because it also represents solutions to many of these problems. But how come companies continue doing stupid stuff? Well, maybe because these problems are regarded more like kind of irritating itches and not symptoms of a deeper, more serious and more systemic problem. But that is exactly what these problems are, um, symptoms of a very serious problem. And we are also looking at the paradox here, as I will come back to. By the way, first of all, we are looking at quite old management technology. Do you know how old budgeting is? Roughly 100 years old. Do you know who invented this stuff 100 years ago? You have heard his name? His name was James O. McKinsey, the founder of McKinsey Consulting. I never met Mr. McKinsey, but actually, I don't think he was an evil man. I think actually his intentions were the best back then. He wanted to help organizations perform better. That was management innovation 100 years ago. And maybe it worked 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, but no longer today, because as we will come back to, things have changed. And the paradox here, again, a process invented to help organizations perform better is today doing exactly the opposite. It has become more of a barrier than a support for getting out the best possible performance. And that, my friends, I would call a pretty serious problem. So we are back to this important word, performance, and I'd like to reflect on that um, word in a very different setting than business and organizations. I would like us to move into traffic, because in traffic, we would also like to experience good performance. For me, that would be a safe and good flow. I simply hate traffic jams. And uh, by the way, I've never understood why it's called the rush hour. There's no rush at all. Those cars are standing dead still. But there's so much that I don't understand. But I think traffic authorities, they want the same. And this is something we often meet, whether it's crossing traffic. And this light has no sensors. And the one who is in control here, the manager who makes decisions about when you can drive and when you have to stop, that's the guy who programmed, or the person that programmed this light, right? And where would that person be as you sit there waiting for the green light? Well, somewhere else. I don't think there was anybody sitting inside that pole. I never checked, but I don't think so. And the information that this programming would be based on would not be entirely fresh information, right? Some historical data, some forecasts, some, yeah, not entirely fresh information. Now, this is one way of creating good performance uh, in traffic, whether it's crossing traffic. Do we have an alternative? A very different solution with exactly the same pr purpose. Yes. Same questions, very different answers, because here we make decisions, right? about when to drive, when to stop, and the information we use to take these decisions is fresh, real-time information. So very different answers. So it could be interesting to compare these two ways of, of um, uh, managing. So let's do that. And I've got a few leading questions for you here. It's actually proven scientifically that the roundabout is not just more efficient, it's actually also safer, and lifetime cycle cost is lower. But we also know that it takes more competence from us to drive in a roundabout comparing to, uh, compared to relate to a traffic light. And going back to our organizations, everything we need to leave behind of traditional management is in many ways much easier for everybody involved compared to what we need to move towards. Right? Uh, take budgeting. I mean, for a manager, it's very, I mean, uh, that manager knows exactly <laughs> um, uh, what can be spent on, 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 or how much can be spent on what. Uh, if you have a bottom line responsibility, exactly what number you shall deliver. Uh, for finance people, when they have explained their, the budget variances, case closed, full control, I mean, it's very easy. But we can't go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for what is good for, for performance or best for performance, even if it takes a bit more from us. But it's not enough with um, uh, authority to make decisions and access to fresh information. We also need a positive value set. If there is a value set here uh, among drivers waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest, that is normally not a big problem here, but in the roundabout, me first, don't care about the rest, is a big problem, because here we are much more dependent on everybody involved sharing this positive, common purpose wish of wanting this to flow well. 
We have to help each other. We have to interact with each other in a very different way than what we need to do in front of that light. Two other important words here. Trust is obviously one ahead of that light. We are not trusted. Here we are trusted. Transparency. Not that important in front of the light, as long as you can see the color. In the roundabout, transparency is very important, because here we need to see and understand the entire situation. The roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And self-regulation is another important word here. Um, and today, organizations need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. The first reason has to do with our business environment. Um, which is, um, um, uh, I mean, the level of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, the VUCA level out there, much, much higher than when I started my budget and planning career in the early uh, 80s. And if we take this VUCA level seriously, it must have implications for how we design our management models compared to if there is little or no VUCA out there. That should be quite obvious. The other reality we need to reflect on is not external, it's internal. It has to do with people, with employees. Asking ourselves, what kind of employees do we generally believe that we have in the organization? And uh, you're probably familiar with Douglas McGregor and his theory X and theory Y. These uh, opposite views on people and what motivates people. And where you know theory X is quite a negative view, a view that most employees are a bunch of potential thieves and crooks, and unless we manage them tightly and keep them on short leeches, they will all run away and do a lot of stupid things and spend money like drunken sailors. Well, those were my words. If you read, if you read um, McGregor's book, he was a bit more polite and academic, but I think that's what he meant. Then you have his theory why, a much more positive view on people, a view that most people actually want to perform. They want to be involved. They want to be listened to. They want to be treated as adults. And we don't need to agree on where our sympathy lies, X or Y, even if I have a certain hope. But it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in theory Y, our management model should look very different compared to if you mainly believe in theory X. And if we then combine these two, then it looks like this. And traditional management lies in that lower left-hand corner with a conscious or unconscious assumption that the world is still a predictable and planable place and that most people is on the X side. If we disagree with that, then that is not the place to be, then we need to move up here by addressing both leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of traditional management, I have used these words to describe. And I recall when I wrote these words, made this slide, I said to myself, Bjarte, don't be too hard on traditional management. But again, I've been sharing this, uh, these words all over the world, and it is a bit scary um, with, in certain audiences, at least, many of the looks I get, I can only interpret in one way. So what? Isn't this the way it has to be? Well, maybe, maybe there was a time when this was the right thing to do. But again, things have changed. So what do we need to do? A few headlines in both dimensions. On the leadership side, more purpose-based, more values-based, less rules-based. We are not saying no rules, we are saying less. More autonomy, more transparency. Here comes that important word again. And this, in this context, transparency is actually good news for scared managers afraid of losing control. Because transparency can, used in the right way, be quite an effective control mechanism. Let me give an example. Um, you might have heard of Roche, the Swiss pharmaceutical giant, uh, who today uh, are on a beyond budgeting journey. They did a very interesting experiment some years ago. Um, in the pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, kicked out all travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So with a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. If you travel to where did you fly, sleep, eat, um, cheap or expensive, open for your colleagues to see, and vice versa. And guess what happened with travel cost in that pilot? Came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism. But, there is a but here. It's a very powerful mechanism. It must be applied with wisdom. So if it becomes naming and shaming, it doesn't work. And that's why we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a control perspective. Right? How can we learn from each other if everything is secret? 
Then last but not least, internal intrinsic motivation as opposed to external extrinsic motivation. And the most common way in business and organizations today to motivate people ex extrinsically is, unfortunately, individual bonus. And I can think of no area where there's a bigger gap between what most research is telling us and what most businesses are practicing. It's so sad and so damaging. That's why we strongly recommend in Beyond Budgeting um, common bonus schemes instead of uh, individual bonus schemes. A number of organizations have the very best intentions on the, uh, uh, in this dimension. If you look at what they write, if you look at what they say, great words, but it doesn't help with these theory Y leadership intentions if you have theory X management processes, which is the case in so many companies, creating these poisonous gaps between what is said and what is done. That is why if we are serious with these words, we need to make sure that we change our management processes so that these processes reflect these words, while at the same time making our management processes more VUCA robust. And a few headlines here. Um, this is why the traditional detailed annual budget has to go, because it represents so much of what you find down here. Um, more specifically, when we shall set targets and goals, to the extent we shall do that, because a lot of companies uh, in our community are not setting targets, but if you do it, could we learn something from football? I have yet to meet a football team stating that the ambition for next season is to score 39 goals and get 42 points. They don't think like that. Those are budget goals, right? They think in terms of league tables, doing well against peers. And in some settings, that way of thinking can also be applied into this stuff. Uh, when it comes to the rhythm of all of this, why on earth shall everything here circulate around the fiscal year of typically January to December? From a pure business point of view, that's very often a completely artificial construct. And so we need more business-driven, more event-driven rhythms. And last but not least, when we shall evaluate performance, we cannot reduce that to compare two number, numbers, actual numbers versus budget, and then conclude. We need a richer, broader performance language. And this, my friends, is what Beyond Budgeting is about on a very high level, to address both leadership and management processes in a coherent, consistent way in order to become more adaptive and more human. It is as simple and as difficult as this. So this is where we kind of the high-level introduction. This is the model itself, the 12 Beyond Budgeting Principles. I will not go through this in detail now, but uh, a few reflections here. Um, first of all, the tagline, performance the right way. Beyond Budgeting changes how we define performance, how we deliver performance, how we evaluate performance, and how we reward performance. Then you can see we are looking at both leadership and management processes with a strong for, uh, focus on creating coherence between the two. If you look at what we say here around purpose, values, uh, uh, transparency, autonomy, it's not that unique. There are many other models, communities out there saying the same. But very often, these models, these communities have not reflected very much of what kind of management processes are needed to activate those good leadership intentions. Right? So, a classical example of a lack of coherence. Um, uh, it doesn't help to talk loud and warm here about uh, autonomy and how fantastic employees we, we have on board, and we would be nothing without you, and we trust you so much. But not that much. Of course, we need detailed travel budgets. Are you crazy? I mean, hypocrisy, and people notice. These principles are principles. This is not the management recipe. What this should mean in an organization depends on that organization's business, culture, history, and that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you have to do is to buy the books, read them, by the way, hire the consultants, tick the boxes. I find that both boring and dangerous. Some people want the recipe, well, then they have to go somewhere else. That doesn't mean that we don't have recommendations on practices, um, but, but that's a different story. Now, um, agile and beyond budgeting. As you can see, many similarities between the, the manifesto um, and, and these principles, uh, but also some differences. And what I will say now is no criticism of agile. 
I've been a big fan for a long time, and I've been in this community for many, many years. There was actually um, there was a post from the Agile Alliance not that long ago saying that the, the first international Agile conference took place in Sardinia, year 2000. I was there, sharing beyond budgeting with a great group of people. Um, many of them are still my friends. But there is an issue around scaling Agile, um, which I want to reflect on. Uh, I think that this is problematic, uh, or has been problematic for a couple of reasons. One reason has to do with the birthplace of um, uh, Agile in software development, how teams work. And what do you think executives in big organizations observed in those pioneer years of Agile? Right? Better projects, better outcomes, more engaged employees. Who can be against that? Hey guys, I love Agile, keep up the good work. Then Agile started to scale, and it had implications for executive beliefs and behaviors. And then it wasn't that fun anymore, right? Beyond budgeting has gone for the throat of those beliefs from day one. We were born at corporate level as a way of running an organization. The other issue has to do with language. I mean, you can't take exactly the same language that did wonders for, for that kind of, um, uh, for, for that area, uh, and, and use it in the scaling. I mean, for an executive who don't play rugby and is, is unfamiliar with, with Agile, might think that Scrum is some kind of skin, skin disease, or that Slack is about laziness, or Sprint is about running faster, and continuous delivery is about 24-7, right? So we need a language here that these guys can understand. We provide that language. They might not agree with us, but they understand what we are talking about. And last but not least, because Agile was born where it was born, there was a lot of things that Agile didn't need to have a view on. If you look at all these management processes on the right-hand side, not very much addressed in Agile for good reasons. When you scale Agile, these holes become visible. These are the holes that beyond budgeting is plugging. That is why the kind of the combination of these two is a wonderful, wonderful idea. But again, no um, uh, agile transformation without beyond budgeting. Simply impossible. A number of companies are today on this journey in some form or shape, and I could have shared hours and hours talking about fascinating management innovation here. We don't have the time. So just a quick example. If you look at the top here, there's a bank, a Swedish bank, called Handelsbanken. They are um, operate in Northern Europe, quite big in the UK, um, around 10,000 employees, 700 branches. Um, and this is the guy that got it all started in that bank. Uh, this is a bank that has, um, um, yeah, and this is something he said about the budget, by the way. Um, uh, this is a bank that has no budgets, no targets, no individual bonus. That's interesting, but it doesn't stop here. They have been operating like this since 1970. But it doesn't stop here either, because this bank has been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. And not just in financial terms, but also on customer satisfaction. And the key, a lot of autonomy, a lot of transparency, a very positive view on people, um, and again, fantastic performance for over so many years. So this was one of the companies, not the only one, but one of the companies that inspired the Beyond Budgeting model that was then um, kind of formally put on paper uh, in, in the late 90s, so a few years before the Agile Manifesto. A question we often get is, does this stuff work? And uh, we have some very strong indications that it does. Um, one indication, very few companies go back once they have started, right? So what is scary today might not be scary tomorrow because it works. So, so what happens instead is that companies get braver. Very few go back. Um, the other thing is that if we look at the performance of these companies, they tend to do well within their own business. But lately, we've had some additional um, indications coming from, of all places, the big consulting firms. And two of these have done surveys about their clients and others. Um, how, what's your experience with Beyond Budgeting? And one of these companies is uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group. And they ask uh, practitioners, what kind of benefits do you see? And this is what um, uh, the respondents came up with. Um, 
And if you look at the, the kind of the most, the, the one at the top, it's a very direct financial impact on higher sales beyond former budget ceilings. There are many other more indirect positive effects that in the end has a good effect on the, um, on the bottom line. Another big company, consulting company, is called Bain, Bain and Company. They had a slightly different angle. They have defined something which they call leading companies, uh, a group of companies, leading companies of in financial planning. And then they looked at to which extent do these companies, um, leading companies, apply these principles compared to the rest. And this is what Bain came up with and the leading companies in, in dark blue here. And again, quite a yeah, compelling picture. Now, um, back to, um, on my final slides here, back to the, uh, that last problem, conflict in purposes. And it goes back to asking a very simple question, why do we budget? And if you ask executives, managers, finance people, others, they would typically come up with three different reasons. They use budgets to set targets, financial targets, sales targets, production targets. But that budget should also be a kind of forecast of what next year can look like in terms of cash flow, profit. And last but not least, this is a resource allocation mechanism, handing out back some money on, on, on operational costs and on investments, projects. And it might seem very efficient to solve all three in one process and one set of numbers, but that's also the problem. What happens when you move into a traditional budget process and upstairs finance wants to understand next year's profit, so they start by asking people they're responsible for sales, what are your best numbers for next year? But everybody knows that what I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a sales target for next year, maybe with a bonus attached to it. And what could that insight do to the level of numbers submitted? Well, trust me, this way. Moving to cost, um, same people, other people are asked, what are your best numbers for next year? But everybody knows that this is my only shot at getting access to resources for next year, right? And maybe some remember that 20% cut from last year. And that memory and that insight might also do something to the level of numbers submitted. This is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but also because it, it stimulates this borderline unethical behaviors. The solution, very simple. We can still do all three things, but we have to do them in three separate processes because these are different things, right? A target is an aspiration, it's what we want to happen. While a forecast is an expectation, what we think will happen, whether we like what we see or not. And resource allocation is about optimization of scarce resources. And having separated, then of course a target can now be more ambitious than a forecast, which is typically should be. But even more important, we can now start to improve each one in ways impossible to um, when it was all bundled in one process and one set of numbers. So now we can have great discussions about how to set better targets using league tables uh, where it makes sense. And as I said, some companies, they simply skip target setting and it works. How can we get the gaming and the politics out of forecasting? And how can we find more intelligent, effective ways of managing costs than Mr. McKinsey could offer us a hundred years ago? And last but not least, having separated, we can now organize each of these on a rhythm that better reflects not just the business we're in, but also each purpose, right? So we will do this uh, not that often, this somewhat more often, and this should take place all the time. Let me finish off two slides on this topic, because this is where the most questions come, right? How do we manage cost without a budget? What has to be there as a kind of um, uh, platform is what we call a cost-conscious mindset, asking different questions than you do in the budget world. A bit simplified here, um, you should do something, it costs money, do we have a budget for it? If you have, it's okay. If not, it's not okay. A bit simplified. We need to hear these kind of questions, right? Is this really necessary? Was it good enough? Uh, how much value is this creating? And is this within my execution framework? As I will come back to on the next slide, this is not an anarchy. There are still guardrails, but we are trying to make the room to move in bigger, even if there still are walls in that room. So, uh, what are some of those practical uh, tools we can offer? Well, to the left, you see what we need to leave behind. That's the traditional detailed annual budget. We need something with more autonomy, flexibility. Here is one alternative. There is still a number in the range of 1,000, 1 million, 10, 100, full autonomy within that guardrail. Um, 
But we can also move from thinking in absolute terms to thinking in relative terms. For instance, comparing input with output. You can spend more if you produce more. You can spend more if you sell more. Right? So more self-regulating. We can even make it even more self-regulating. So there's no kind of number here of X euros per unit, but your <laughs> euros per unit should be competitive versus peers. Right? Um, if you have internal profit centers with a tough bottom line target, I mean, that's also a way of managing cost. Right? Uh, these guys cannot run away and spend money like crazy, but if that spending creates value, it's okay. And the last alternative, nothing at all. Nothing. No budget, no target. The only numbers here are actual cost numbers, and we monitor actual cost numbers. Right? If it looks okay, we do nothing. If it looks a bit strange, we take a look at it. Might be a very good explanation, but, and this is important, we might also come across teams, managers, who consciously or unconsciously abuse the trust that lies in this model. The further to the right, the more trust we show. Right? And the only thing you know if you show trust in an organization, is that someone will abuse it, right? So that's not the issue. The issue is how do we respond? And the simple but wrong response is the clothing hangers example, to punish everybody because somebody did something wrong, right? This trust thing doesn't work. Look what happened here and happened here. Back to the old budget, right? Simple but wrong. The right response is to take the, that very firm talk with those involved and let it have the necessary consequences. This is not about being soft and evasive. It's about not putting everybody in jail because somebody did something wrong. The further to the right we are, the more stronger you have to be on values and direction. And then two additional guardrails that also can be used. Decision authorities. How big a decision can a manager make in terms of money before you have to go one level up, and also um, spending guidelines. Travel costs in Europe, we fly coach. Intercontinental, we can fly business. Nothing to do with travel budgets. So that is what I wanted to share with you. I'm sorry about the rush, but it's a big topic, and 45 minutes is short. Um, this is the long version. Um, and uh, this book has more of everything. Um, including more cases, and uh, also what we did in a company called Borealis back in the kicked out the budget, mid-90s, before there was anything called Beyond Budgeting. Um, a chapter about Beyond Budgeting in Agile, and more about implementation uh, advice. And this book is actually just out in German, um, which I'm very pleased with. And um, both these books have kind of... Um, kind of the cl classical um, thickness, uh, which is too thick for busy people with limited time to read. So my last book, which is just out, is a shorter book focused at executives. Um, this can be read on a, on a flight, and there's also an audio book uh, out. So um, that's it. These are my contact uh, details. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, highly appreciated. Uh, and I only write about beyond budgeting. There are no cats and dogs and grandchildren, I promise. Um, this is the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, um, an international network of companies interested in this. We run international conferences. The next one is in London, um, mid-November. So if you want to check out that one, have a look at the website. And it's also then my website. And then finally, um, if you're interested, if, if, if this was a, a good teaser, we are running a one-day workshop uh, tomorrow, um, which of course then we will go much more in-depth on all of this. Questions? Yes. All right. Constantine is helping, but I'm moving fast. Uh, um, so it's not just companies that use budgets, governments also do? Mm. Uh, do you have any examples of any governments that have done beyond budgeting? I've got the great example of a public sector organization. Um, Norway is the social services organization, huge organization. They have 12 uh, kind of client contact centers across Norway. And um, I had a session with them about beyond budgeting in 2019. From 2020, they did an experiment. In two of these centers, the message was that no cost budget, you can spend whatever you need to in order to do a good job, but not more. If you want to hire people, you still need to have a talk with the level above, but no annual kind of personnel budgets. Um, and 2020 was the first year of the pandemic, so 
all centers had lower cost, but none had higher cost reductions than the two pilots, minus 50% in both. So from 21, they become braver uh, than it was uh, 6 or 12, and today all 12 contact centers are running without uh, cost budgets, and it works wonderful. And I actually have a chapter about this in my book, about beyond budgeting in the public sector. The public sector, um, beyond budgeting is just as relevant for the public sector as for the private sector, and the public sector needs beyond budgeting just as much as the private sector. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I've been following Beyond Budgeting since I uh, encountered the budgeting process as a manager. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I liked it. Um, uh, do you have any experience of combination of Beyond Budgeting with less or less like? And do you have any tips or learnings for us to do things better? Well, again, I mean, I, I think there are, um, there are so many similarities between um, uh, beyond budgeting and a number of concepts and ideas and, 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 and uh, communities in the broader Agile community. So um, my advice to all my friends in the Agile community is check up beyond budgeting and um, uh, uh, kind of join us in pushing and challenging the organization about this stupid way of managing. Because, you know, we are all fighting the same enemy, if I can use that word. We come from different places and so on, but the more we can join forces, the stronger we are. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, Marcel, I have a question. Yes. Um, do you have any advice for teams who are like deep in, in the service? I, as for, for example, I manage a team of um, in the technical IT huh. of a big corporate. Mm. And so, we, like, which, which KPIs or which numbers would you create? Because I, I don't have any contact to any customer or any revenue stream mm -hmm. that I could mm -hmm. create a nice number with. Yeah. Well, um, if you go back to this menu, I mean, uh, this is one alternative, which is much better than the traditional budget. Uh, this is another alternative, right? Uh, nothing at all, just like I just talked about in that social services organization. But in general, to your question, I mean, we often hear um, kind of business units heads and, and managers of local units saying, I love this stuff, but the group is saying no. Our view is that your autonomy to do stuff is often higher than what you think. Because when the stupid stuff is coming from above, then up with the umbrella, protect your organization. Don't turn around and let it pass further out. Protect your organization, try to manage as much as possible like this, and then get help from some finest people to feed the big system. It's not ideal, but it's better than doing nothing. And again, this, on this menu, there should be something for everybody when it comes to cost management. So this is a big applause for you, Beate. Thank you so much for your wisdom knowledge. What a well-structured and nice keynote here. Thank you very much.